Do you want to win more at horse racing? If the answer is yes, then this video is for you. Hopefully, these videos motivate you into positive action. Let's crack on. So I want to share with you some of my secrets to success. First things first though, I just quickly want to pick up on that with professional betting, it's not one size fits all. You've got to consider your own circumstances. That means where you live, financials, time, just take on board everything. Consider your own strengths. If you're better in something else, go and do that. But this is particular false racing I'm going to cover today. Mindset and work ethic is the most important factor. If you haven't got it in your head, you don't have no follow through, which is the next point, then you're not going to make it as a professional gambler. And on that final note, don't let people bring you down. If you have somebody who's a naysayer, ignore them, move away, concentrate on the job ahead. So coverage. My main interest is UK and French racing. I also cover all uh, US racing, but probably because of the time difference to a lesser scale. I will share part of my process for UK racing. These are some of the, the little secrets or some of the things that I actually follow to profit from this type of uh, gambling. With French racing, I will tell you why it is lucrative and what you should do about it. And with US racing, I'm gonna give you some practical advice and some basic understanding. So let's crack on as per promised with UK racing. Firstly, I bet flat and national hunt. I don't touch all, all weather. I leave that to the others. They're more specialist in that. They've probably got more information, more uh, localization. So I'm sticking with what I know, which is a flat and national land. Foremost, I'm looking for weak favorites to take on. You know, as a former bookmaker, I would want to stand something. I would want to lay something at big rods than the other bookmakers. And to do that, you know, I would be uh, fine combing the card and deciding on my plan of attack. So 80% of my bets come from using this method. My margin, I just want to share this with you, with planned bets, is about 16% on the flat and 18% over national land. I consider myself a little bit better with national land and the reasons I'll get into a little bit later. Um, I do want to pick up on one thing. It does cost me about 3% uh, to get my bets placed. I don't place the bets myself. That's why I'm quite happy to talk on uh, YouTube because they're not going to see my face in a betting shop. And uh, yeah, so I uh, am paying people, uh, bet places, 3% of turnover to put my bets on. But obviously these are people that you can trust. They're not gonna share this information with other people. And uh, you know, they do things right and that are proven to me. So with exchange betting, the margins slip down a little bit. Uh, with the lay, it's 8.6%, and with the actual bets, it's 5.7%. Now, the reason for this is that it's obviously you're fighting against something that's a bit sharper. Uh, secondly, uh, the uh, you're waiting for liquidity to come in, which is the normally nearer the time of the race, and then the market's more established. You know, so take on board that, but it's still, you know, you can... This this is like farming bets. This is you're 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 going through them. You're doing it on a race to race uh, evaluation process. So you know take that into consideration. But uh, also some bets I do place through middlemen in other countries like Germany, Italy, and places like this. Right, uh, yeah, there's options to get uh, a bit of money down without them noticing or uh, you know banning you too quickly. So. With the evaluation process, as you can see in the top left hand corner, I say in particular, I look to take on. This means these are the reasons I am opposing that particular uh, horse or runner or whatever you like to call it. And this is what I want you to take, you know, take on. We're gonna cover some of the positives in a minute, but these are sort of the negative factors, you know, what I'm, the reason I've got to take on this particular favorite, right? So. 
I don't like ex-flat horses that are switching to chasing. It's very, very rare that I would uh, bet such. And while there's exceptions to the rule, right, I would say 99% of cases, if I see a, a, a ex-flat horse, it's a very short odds going over fences, I'm thinking to myself, this is not going to be as good over fences as it was over hurdles, and I'm ready to take it on. Um, also, those switching from flat to hurdles at an older age, you think about it, this is an afterthought. You know, they probably raced 30 or 40 times on the flats and now they're switching to hurdles. And one of the reasons for that is because they've got nowhere to go on the flat. They do not reach the same standards and they're usually worth taking on. Also, raised French imports. A lot of British trainers uh, going over there, paying the top dollar for uh, uh, French horses that are really unproven. They bring them over, they've got a massive reputation, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to deliver. You know, as they say, uh, you know, you, you need proof before you start taking short odds about something. Also, moving from a big stable to a smaller stable, you've got to think about it. If they've been in a big stable, they follow the process, they've been hard trained, and then their life after that, you know, when they start moving down to lesser facilities, um, uh, you know, riders that are probably not so good at home, and uh, they're eating different, it's obviously not at the same level as it was before so uh, it, again exceptions to the rules you know some also do better at small stables but uh, i would say they've been overtrained and they're worth avoiding at the beginning uh, unproven runners at short odds now by unproven runners i mean those coming like from the point to point field and then going early in future they're probably going to be uh, chasers uh, they've also raced over further like three miles whereas they probably start over two miles over hurdles and uh, national and flat horses and especially those national and flat horses that have uh, uh, you know stayed over um, on the flats and used every one of their options that means up to four runs right if they've had one run just for a little bit of experience and put them away that's fair enough but if they've had like uh, three or four runs and they're just average right i don't expect them to improve over hurdles and the reason for that is they stayed over on the flat too long and that suggests that they couldn't uh, jump efficiently so uh, talking horses overly tipped by pundits you know if you see something that's in the newspapers splashed all over you know that the punters are going to follow them in the bookmakers see this to slash the odds the odds will go down and then they'll start coming back nearer the race so you, you'll get like a five to one shot you'll be back down to say five to two and then near the race time it'd be like four to one you can either lay these horses or you can just take them on uh, gambles uh, i was going to say liabilities may bookmakers overreact but everything makes bookmakers overreact even if they don't have liabilities because they're all copying each other so if one of the odds is coming down or you know it's moving down on the exchanges it doesn't necessarily mean there won't be any type of rebalancing later if it's gamble right it's not interesting to you unless you was the first person in on the gamble i mean we've done gambles obviously but uh, uh, that's because we're in control of the situation but you shouldn't be following on other people into gambles Runners that finish second and third too often, this one today, for example, it's run 23 times, it won zero, it came second six times, it came third six times. Uh, horses are pack animals, they like chasing, but they don't like putting their head in front. Not all of them are leaders, and uh, this one in particular, it's 72. You know, why should a, a horse that's raced 23 times be 72? Giving weight in small fields. Now, a small field means it's going to be more tactical. And uh, with that in mind, you know, the weight will count for more because they won't start racing until the sort of uh, second last or even in flat races. It's the same thing. Giving weight in small fields, and especially if they're short odds, it's something to take on. On proven on the ground, now, I don't care what anybody says, if a horse is only raced on uh, good ground, right, and uh, today's conditions are heavy, it doesn't mean that it won't get them, but uh, it means that, you know, it's another factor to uh, sort of uh, prove itself on. And you've got to just sort of add that into the margin a little bit. So if it was going to be even money on uh, uh, good ground and it's still even money on uh, heavy ground, then you might want to sort of take it on. Now, handicap mark qualifying day, this applies to anything, uh, uh, flat, na uh, flat uh, uh, national hunt. Um, when a horse is racing for this sort of second or third time, right, it's going to get a handicap mark afterwards. If it's going to be a racehorse for the rest of its life, you know, if it's a lower level one, why would the trainer want to 
uh, really sort of uh, go for that race today. He'd rather get himself a nice handicap mark and then he can take advantage of that uh, at uh, a later stage, right? So uh, bumper form also, I just want to mention, is often uh, overrated. You see these horses, they won a couple of races over bumpers and then the uh, big expectancy when they go over hurdles, but it doesn't always materialise. Often they're false favourites, you know, it's like they're sort of false flag operation and you've got to be a little bit sort of uh, careful of these uh, type of horses so i would tend to lay them obviously you know you're looking at an animal for what it is and uh, but uh, you know that that's with my sort of marked eye but uh, with bumper form it's often overrated and also penalised runners in uh, novices like flat turtles chase it really doesn't matter if they're penalised it's going to be quite difficult for them and also i just want to mention uh, certain trainers i avoid i'm not going to list them here because i probably get a cease and desist uh, uh, letter from a lawyer somewhere and uh, we don't need that and we don't need any complaints on uh, youtube but you can figure out that for yourself there's some trainers just doing it for themselves yeah and uh, finally in this sort of evaluation process are suspect stayers and uh, this is especially when they go on to heavier tracks you know uh, stiffer tracks and uh, stepping up from like two miles to three miles it's always uh, uh, you know you've got to look at the odds and what chance they are but uh, generally I would send out a red flag to me. So I mentioned that uh, we should also look at some of the positives as well because we're not just looking to take uh, uh, on these favourites. We also then got to find uh, the winner, all right? So uh, early switch to chasing is a good example. If, uh, you know, you've had uh, something that's around four or five times, then it's switching to chasing. That's uh, a good sign. It means it's a natural jumper. When they've been waiting 30 runs before switching to the bigger fences, then it's a negative. So early switch to chasing is good. Uh, strong st uh, stayers over stiffer tracks. So, you know, tracks like uh, Leicester, Carlisle and whatever. If you've got a strong stayer and uh, they're running over a longer distance over there, then, they, you know, it's, it's, it's really of a benefit. Uh, switching back in code after improvement, imagine that you've had, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, something switch from hurdles back to um, flat and during that uh, time on the flat it's gone from a rating of 70 to 85, you know, it's improved 15 pounds and now it goes back to the hurdles with its old uh, fl uh, old rating right so, you know obviously the handicapper is not allowed to react to that right then it's got an advantage and it's vice versa as well you know Erdl is going back to the flat and so on right i mean obviously you've got to take into consideration every every situation is different but uh, that's just the the basis of it right and uh, making a quick switch to handicaps if a trainer's uh, got one handicapped and it's going straight into handicaps then he must think it's got a decent handicap mark and that sort of speaks for itself yeah and uh, the vice versa of uh, switching from a top trainer down to a lower grade trainer what about uh, when um, you know a horse uh, is moving from uh, a trainer with a poor strike rate to one with a bigger strike rate. You remember back in the day, uh, you know, uh, Martin Pike was a specialist at this, but uh, uh, basically, you know, you're moving up in grade, you, you, you're moving up in terms of uh, uh, facilities, you're moving up in training methods, uh, you're going to get more chances. And so uh, Dr. Richard Newland is uh, currently a trainer that's uh, particularly good in this, but uh, anyway, you'll find them out for yourselves, right? So quickly on to French racing. We own horses in France, that's one of the reasons. Um, uh, even the average uh, person in France probably gets about 75% uh, return uh, of the money that he invests on uh, into, into French racing, whereas in the UK it's probably about 40%, you know, waste of time. So um, costs are lower, everything's lower, uh, the price money's bigger, and uh, uh, you also get a lot more sort of claimers where you can buy and sell and do a little bit of trading. That's why we own horses in France. Uh, UK bookmakers like knowledge and that means with their odds right so you can usually take advantage of those uh, silly odds and uh, uh, they're very wrong they're all too busy copying each other uh, French punters are predictable and um, by this uh, we mean that they'll bet uh, certain jockeys they'll bet uh, certain uh, you know if they see one and one next to the horse's name they'll think it's automatically going to win so you know they're the typical sort of uh, uh, nomad traveler in, in terms of that uh, uh, they're a bit flighty and they, they don't really understand the game 
game. So um, French punters are predictable and when grounds conditions change, uh, stepping up in distance or, you know, uh, then it becomes a different story, of course. Uh, evaluation process is much easier for the aforementioned. Uh, options to bet fix or PMU with rebate. We get like a 4% rebate on uh, the win pool in France, but uh, even if you don't, you can still win. Uh, bigger prize money means more tryers, and that's very important, obviously. Uh, if uh, you know something's trying because uh, the prize money is 15,000, 20,000, you know, they don't need to knock it uh, uh, back. They don't need to stop a even money shot uh, winning because they're going to benefit more by betting because that's not true. Right, so the four molds are better than the UK. One of the reasons for that is also is that uh, the handicapper doesn't uh, uh, reassess after each uh, race. If also just comes second uh, by a nose and being 10 lengths clear of the, the rest of the field, it's still going to carry that same mark next time out. And uh, yeah, you know, it's usually a standout, yeah. Um, our win margin in betting fixed odds in France is about 26%. And on the PMU betting with rebate, it's about 9% to 12% for jumps. It's obviously more difficult, uh, but these are done nearer the time. So it's very, very similar to uh, thinking about the betting exchanges, you know, where we're using it because we think we've got a slight advantage there. So they're late bets, they're not necessarily pre-planned. And uh, that's why the actual margins are a little bit lower uh, than uh, what you'd accept by fixed odds, yeah? Quickly on to US racing, smaller pool of horses. You know, we saw this during the COVID times. You get the same horses running the same tracks week in, week out. Uh, now, that's not necessarily true. You know, for the bigger races, uh, they do ship around. But uh, it gives you more options. You know, it gets you a, a better fix, yeah? Uh, fixed odd bookies and exchanges offer great value. Sometimes you'll see odds of like uh, uh, three on the... Uh, PMU in uh, uh, the States and you'll be getting like six or seven uh, with the bookies or exchanges if you know what you're doing. So, you know, they, you can take advantage. Yeah. Uh, you also, as a lot of US punters do, they're taking like rebates from bookmakers on certain tracks. So if the pool is like 16% takeout uh, for the win, they can probably get a 5 to 8% uh, rebate. Um, so... You know, obviously, you've got to shop all the odds. You've got to try to figure it out. But if you're sort of crossing exchange odds, bookies odds, and uh, pool odds, and you can get on all of them, then you're giving yourself a nice advantage. Also, with the US racing, I just want to mention one thing very quickly. Earlier races are a great guide. And by a great guide, what I mean by that is that, you know, if uh, uh, you, you'll see if there's pace in the race, right, are, are, are the horses going with it? You know, you... It, it's like you've got to be observant it's a bit like dog racing in a way uh, i don't wish to say that but pay attention pay attention to the draw uh, sometimes it's not always at the rails uh, advantageous uh, sometimes you you're better off uh, racing wide but uh, you know you'll, you'll see which horses are benefiting from uh, different types of draw yeah and also um, use betting pool sizes to guide so don't just look at the win pool. Look at how many, how often that uh, particular uh, horse or that bet is, uh, you know, in the place pools into uh, other types of pools. It will give you some idea of its popularity and where it's expected, right? So sometimes the, the actual win pool looks totally different to actually what uh, the rest of the pools match up to. So just bear that in mind. So finally, the closing arguments for this, right? If you can win, get on. It's easy to win at uh, racing, right? It's, it really is easy. I would encourage everybody to get into horse racing if they uh, have at least a little bit of ability. No excuses. Your job is to find solutions. You know, it's like any business, right? If you're selling something, you've got to find a way to sell it. And uh, it's the same in any type of betting. You've just got to keep finding solutions. Don't be lazy. Uh, if you want to learn out more, check out the video that I'm linking up here um, because we did cover one. We, we've got 100,000 clicks on it already. It's uh, definitely worth your while. So a few other golden rules. And you need to subscribe uh, to the channel, right? Don't just subscribe. It's, you know, hit the like button, get it popular, and then we'll start doing more. You'll benefit more. Everybody will benefit more. And uh, we're all a winner from that. So that's it for now. You're through to boot camp again. We'll see us in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.